All right, get ready to dive into a topic that will really make you think. Yeah, this one's a, a fascinating one for sure. We're going to be exploring the life and legacy of Dr. B. R. Ambedkar. A truly pivotal figure in India's journey towards social justice. Absolutely. And the question we're wrestling with today is, could he be considered a bodhisattva? Hmm. That's a question that I think uh, really gets to the core of what a bodhisattva represents. It's not a title you just throw around lightly, is it? No, not at all. It uh, signifies a very profound level of compassion and commitment. Okay, so for our listeners who might not be as familiar with the term, how would you explain what a bodhisattva is? Well, think of it this way. Imagine a graduation ceremony. Okay, I'm picturing it. You've got all these students ready to receive their diplomas. Ready to move on to the next chapter. Exactly. But then there's one student who chooses to stay behind. They don't go up to get their diploma. No, they see that some of their classmates are struggling. Maybe they need a little extra help to cross the stage. So they put their own celebration on hold to help others succeed. Precisely. And that, in essence, is the spirit of a bodhisattva. Wow, that's a really powerful analogy. They could reach enlightenment themselves, but they choose to stay back and guide others towards it. Even if it means delaying their own journey. Exactly. It's about putting the well-being of others before their own. That's true selflessness right there. And, you know, when you look at Mbabekar's life story... W yeah, when I was going through the sources you sent over... I was struck by some interesting parallels. Oh, absolutely. There are definitely some echoes of this idea in his journey. I mean, just think about his background for a second. The man was a brilliant scholar. Oh, without a doubt. We're talking degrees from Columbia University and the London School of Economics. Elite institutions. He could have had a life of privilege and prestige anywhere in the world. Absolutely. Opportunities galore. And that's what I find so compelling. He could have chosen a very comfortable path, but instead... He made a conscious decision. To return to India. A nation grappling with immense social inequalities. And that decision, to me, speaks volumes. It does, doesn't it? It suggests a commitment that goes beyond personal ambition. He wasn't just returning to his homeland. He was dedicating his life to uplifting the downtrodden. To fighting for those who are marginalized, those who had been denied basic rights. And what's even more remarkable is that it wasn't just a vague sense of wanting to help. No, he had very specific ideas about how to create a more just and equitable society. And I think his exposure to life in other countries seeing firsthand the levels of equality that were possible really shaped his vision for India. Absolutely. He saw what could be. And he refused to accept the status quo. He believed that India could achieve that same level of progress. And a crucial part of his vision for social transformation was rooted in, you guessed it, Buddhism. So he saw Buddhism as a pathway to both personal development and societal change. A powerful force for individual and collective liberation. But was it a straightforward adoption of traditional Buddhist teachings? Or was there something more to it? Ah, now that's where things get really interesting. And Bedkar didn't simply embrace Buddhism as it was. He put his own spin on it. You could say that he interpreted it through the lens of India's unique challenges. And what did he call this unique interpretation? He called it Neo-Buddhism. Neo-Buddhism. It was his attempt to create a form of Buddhism that was specifically tailored to the needs of the Indian people. Okay, so Neo-Buddhism, what set it apart from traditional Buddhism? Well... One of the key distinguishing features was Ambedkar's strong emphasis on fraternity. Fraternity? Now, why would that be so central to his vision? Because he believed that true equality couldn't be achieved without fostering a sense of shared responsibility and connection between individuals and communities. Interesting. So not just focusing on individual enlightenment. No, it's about actively working to create a more just and interconnected society. And given his lifelong battle against the caste system and all forms of social discrimination. It makes perfect sense that fraternity would be so central to his vision. It was about breaking down those rigid barriers, yeah. dismantling those deeply ingrained hierarchies. Precisely. Fraternity was the key. Building bridges, fostering empathy, recognizing the inherent worth of every human being. Exactly. And this brings us to another fascinating layer of this whole Bodhisattva question. Okay, lay it on me. Well, there's this prophecy within Buddhism. A prophecy? Yes, a prophecy that predicted a Bodhisattva would revive the religion in India after 2,500 years. Okay, now this is where it starts to feel like we're stepping into a detective novel. A prophecy, you say? So we've got this prophecy about a Bodhisattva reviving Buddhism in India. Right, and it gets really interesting when you consider Ambedkar's role in all of this. Okay, I'm all ears. Tell me more. Well, in 1954, the Sixth Buddhist Council was held in Burma. Okay. 
And Ambedkar, he was invited to speak there. Makes sense. He was a leading voice on Buddhism in India. Oh, absolutely. And his speech at the council, it really made waves. I can imagine, given everything we've discussed about his vision. His passionate advocacy for the Dalit community, his vision for an equitable India rooted in Buddhist principles, it all resonated deeply with the attendees. It sounds like he really struck a chord. He did, and it had a profound impact, so much so that a prominent monk at the council, yeah, he actually proclaimed Ambedkar to be the very bodhisattva foretold in the prophecy. Wow, that's a pretty dramatic moment. A prophecy, a council? A proclamation. It's quite a story, isn't it? And the timing of it all is just remarkable. What do you mean? Well, just two years after that council in 1956, yeah. Ambedkar formally converted to Buddhism. Hold on, let me do the math here. If you count back 2,500 years mm -hmm. from 1956, uh -huh. that aligns almost perfectly with the time of Buddha's passing. It does, doesn't it? The timing is uncanny. And for many, it really cemented the idea that Ambedkar was this prophesied figure. The bodhisattva who had returned to revive Buddhism in India. Precisely. It seemed to tie everything together in a very neat and compelling way. So we've got the prophecy, we've got the timing of his conversion, we've got his unique take on Buddhism with this strong emphasis on fraternity. All pointing towards him embodying the bodhisattva ideal. That's a pretty strong case, wouldn't you say? It is. On the surface, it all seems to fit together quite well. But there's a but coming, isn't there? There is. And here's where it gets even more intriguing. You ready for this? Hit me with it. Despite all of this, despite the prophecy, the timing, the proclamation, yeah. Ambedkar himself actually rejected the Bodhisattva label. He rejected it. Now that's a twist. I mean, why would he push back against something that seemed to align so well with his life's work? It is a bit of a head scratcher, isn't it? But when you consider Ambedkar's personality, his approach to things, yeah. it might start to make a bit more sense. Okay, I'm intrigued. Help me understand this. Well, Ambedkar was known for his pragmatism. Pragmatism? Yes, his focus was always on tangible solutions, practical actions. He was all about getting things done, making a real difference. Exactly. He wasn't one for grand pronouncements or mystical interpretations. So you're thinking maybe he saw the Bodhisattva label as too mystical, too otherworldly. It's possible. He might have felt it was unnecessarily elevating him to this, I don't know, spiritual realm. And he wanted to keep the focus on the practical work of social change, on tangible improvements. I think that's a very plausible explanation. You know, he might have even viewed the elaborate mythologies surrounding bodhisattvas as a distraction from the real issues at hand. Interesting point. It's like he was saying, don't put me on a pedestal. Don't get lost in prophecies and labels. Let's focus on building a more just and equitable society. Precisely. And I think that's a crucial thing to remember as we consider his legacy. His actions spoke louder than any label. Absolutely. He may have rejected the title, but his unwavering commitment to uplifting the marginalized, his tireless fight for equality, those were the true markers of his character. So even if he didn't explicitly identify as a bodhisattva, he lived a life that embodied those core principles of compassion and service to others. And that in itself is a pretty powerful statement. It is. And what I find fascinating is that despite his personal stance, Ambedkar's legacy is still deeply intertwined with the bodhisattva concept. How so? Well, think about how he's remembered today. He's become this powerful symbol of hope and inspiration for marginalized communities throughout India. That's true. He's often revered as a champion of the oppressed, someone who dedicated his life to fighting for a better world. Exactly. And that symbolism often manifests in a very tangible way. Good one. It's not uncommon to see statues of Ambedkar placed right alongside statues of Buddha. Oh, I've seen that myself, especially in Dalit communities. It's a visual representation of how deeply his life and work resonate with those core values of compassion, selflessness, service to others. The values at the heart of the Bodhisattva path. Precisely. It's like, even though he rejected the label, the connection is still there in the minds of many. That's remarkable. We've gone from historical facts to philosophical questions, prophecies, and even statues. And Bedker's story is truly multifaceted, isn't it? It is. And I think what makes it so compelling is that there's no easy answer to the question we posed at the beginning. Was he a Bodhisattva? We've explored the evidence. We've looked at the arguments for and against. But ultimately, it comes down to personal interpretation. You've presented a lot for us to think about here. It's like we've peeled back layers of history, philosophy, and personal conviction. And I hope it sparks some reflection for our listeners as well. It certainly has for me. Where do we even go from here? Yeah. It's really made me think, 
you know, even without a clear-cut answer, just exploring this question has opened up so many other avenues of thought. It has, hasn't it? It's like we've stumbled upon this hidden doorway in Embedkar's story. Yeah, and I think it's because by diving into this whole Bodhisattva debate, mm. we've actually touched upon a much broader question. Which is? Well, does someone have to explicitly claim a title or identify with a concept to truly embody its spirit. Ooh, that's a good one. Yeah, it yeah. really makes you think about how we define these label, these ideals, right? Are they about outward declarations or are they more about our actions, our choices, mm -hmm. how we actually live our lives? I think that's the beauty of M. Bedker's legacy. It challenges us to grapple with these questions. To think critically about our own values and how we choose to move through the world. Exactly. And you know, as we've been talking, I keep coming back to something you said earlier oh, yeah. about M. Bedker's pragmatism. Ah, uh, yes, his focus on tangible solutions. Right. He was less concerned with titles and labels and more focused on creating real change in the world. So do you think that focus on action, that commitment to social justice? Yeah. Could it be seen as a form of bodhisattva-like compassion in itself? I think that's a very insightful observation if we look at the core of the bodhisattva concept. This idea of delaying personal fulfillment to help others achieve liberation. Right. And when you consider Ambedkar's dedication to uplifting the oppressed, it definitely aligns with that way of thinking. He saw suffering, he saw injustice, and he dedicated his life to alleviating it. He didn't just sit back and theorize about it. He rolled up his sleeves and got to work. So maybe even though he didn't wear the Bodhisattva Pelpul, he lived a life that embodied its essence. I think that's a powerful takeaway for anyone engaging with M. Bedker's work. It's not about getting caught up in rigid definitions. Or theological debates. It's about looking at the impact of someone's actions, the legacy they leave behind. What did they contribute to the world? And so as we wrap up this deep dive into the life and legacy of Dr. B.R. M. Bedker, mm. I want to leave our listeners with a final question to ponder. Okay, shoot. Even if M. Bedker didn't see himself as a bodhisattva, do his life and work embody the spirit of that concept? What do you think? It's a question worth reflecting on, and I would encourage everyone listening to explore Ambedkar's writings for themselves. They're full of incredible insights that are still so relevant today. Insights that can challenge us to think differently about equality, justice, and the kind of world we want to build. He was a truly remarkable figure, and his ideas continue to have a profound impact, not just in India, but around the world. So keep learning, keep questioning, and most importantly, keep diving deep.